Aliyah Swaby, public education reporter for the Texas Tribune. I'm joined today by State Representative Harold Dutton, the new chair of the House Public Education Committee. Dutton, a Democrat from Houston, has represented House District 142 since 1985. On February 4th, he was appointed chair of the House Public Education Committee by House Speaker Dade Phelan. Dutton is also a member of the Judiciary and Civil Jurisprudence Committee and serves as a chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. So to get started, I I wanted to point out that there were a lot of um, gasps after your appointment was was announced. For many, it was entirely unexpected. Um, You're one of the longest serving members of the Texas House and you're replacing Representative Dan Huberty who's chaired the committee for the last two sessions. Um, So give us the the elevator pitch basically for for your role on the committee Um, For the educators and parents and advocates who are watching, why are you the right person to lead this committee during a time of these compounding crises? Well, let me thank you first for inviting me to share with you today. I I appreciate that. And let me thank uh, Speaker Phelan for appointing me to be the chair of public education. You know, I've I've actually not only, I'm on third, I'm third, uh, third in seniority in the house. Uh, but I've actually had the pleasure of serving as on the public education committee longer than anybody in the history of Texas. Uh, I have served actually, uh, I've been here 19 sessions, uh, but 17 of those sessions I've spent on public education. Um, I asked when I came to the legislature to be on public education uh, and that's where I got placed. And, and one, of my, one of my good friends said, Harold, why do you know public education? They don't have lobbyists that come around public education. Um, And I said, no, but I was interested in what happens uh, to children, particularly children in my district. Um, And so that's that's why I wanted to be on it. But but more especially, I think that um, I've worked with Dan Huberty. I thought he was a great chair. Um, I even told Dan that um, I, I, I was I was unexpected to be the chair of public education. So I was looking forward all the time and talking to Dan as if he was going to be the chair. So, but anyway, he and I are very good, very close, very good friends. We've had a, a lots of time to work with each other on different issues. Um, and so now what we're gonna do is basically just switch chairs on the public education committee. Uh, I used to be on his left, now he'll be on my right. <laughs> sure. So you've often um, parted ways with fellow Democrats in the House on the topic of charter schools um, and sometimes have joined Republicans to sponsor bills that provide more funding for charter schools or, you know, are on their list of priorities. Um, You also in 2015 co-authored a bill um, or a law that ended up allowing the state to take over chronically failing school districts. Um, talk to me about what that means for your role on the committee this session. What can we expect to see in terms of you know, school choice um, and accountability legislation? Well, I think, first of all, um, I'm always find myself in the position of having uh, to explain to people and sometimes members that uh, charter schools are public schools. Um, and in fact, we have only about six or seven percent of the students in Texas that are going to charter schools. And so when people create this animosity between charter schools and traditional public schools, I, I think it's false. I think, I, I, I don't think that's very productive, it, particularly when you look at trying to help students and improve student outcomes, because that does nothing to help improve student outcomes. But I think when, when parents look at schools and say, look, I'd rather send my child to this charter school than this traditional public school, that ought to be their right. I I didn't start off as a charter school advocate. Uh, I've told this story many times that I, you know, I had a friend who owned a charter school and invited me to be the, be the commencement speaker at one of their graduation exercises. And I I did, I went. Uh, And what amazed me was the young lady who was the first in line when we were passing out diplomas, which he asked me to come and help him do, she was She was a valedictorian of a class, but she was 21 years old. She had two babies, um, and yet she was the first person in her family to ever graduate high school. That, every time I thought about charter schools, I saw that young lady's face. 
because we were able to get her into University of Houston downtown campus. Uh, and I believe she's graduated. I don't know that, but I think that's what's happened now. But I thought to myself every time, where would that happen except the charter school? Where could she have gone back to a traditional public school and done all that? I don't think so. And so for me, um, that was my Bernie Bush experience I, with charter schools. I, I just didn't think that um, we were providing enough alternatives in the way of schools uh, to make sure that every child who was in a situation had an opportunity to get a public education. And we should always do that. Um, and I don't know why sometimes Democrats or people have been on one side versus the other, because to me, it's counterproductive to trying to get the problem solved in public schools and in education so that we can make sure all children have a future. Because one of the things I think we all agree on is we're here because you and I are here because we had an education. Uh, that's where it started. And if you don't have that, you have a future that's pretty bleak. Uh, what is that? I mean, in terms of legislation this session, what do you see as being the priorities um, under those, you know, in those topics this session? Well, I, you know, I think uh, we've had the same topic that we needed to address ever since. You know, I was reading the back, uh, I started reading the old H. Ross Perot report back in 1984. Uh, and uh, I was, it was interesting because there was so much of it that, that, that even reflects today. Uh, for instance, when we try to improve student outcomes, um, that's the thing that uh, we somehow or another keep, uh, keep losing grasp of and in trying to ensure that every child comes together and learn. What we have now is a situation where, and this is one of the things I want to do, is we have a number of children who have been affected, for example, by this pandemic, uh, who were on the bottom. And the only thing that's happened to them is they've set a new level for the bottom. And we have some kids who have slid out because they were on the bubble, necessarily educationally. But somehow or another, we've got to get them, number one, back on grade level. Uh, I'm not sure that we know enough about whether or not they're one, two or three or four grade levels behind, but we need to figure that out. And then we need to stop them from ever getting behind. Uh, and I think that involves uh, all of us, not just on this committee, but in the legislature, to figure out how do we stop kids from getting behind? You know, I was always fond of saying that kids, we have these dropout programs for children that, that many of it, much of it starts in ninth grade. Well, I, I was always fond of saying that, that kids leave in the ninth grade. They didn't drop out in the ninth grade. They dropped out in third grade, uh, perhaps, when they couldn't keep up and they couldn't understand the basics. And so as a consequence, they went along and the delta between them and other kids got further and further away to the point where in ninth grade, they couldn't withstand just the, the, the scrutiny of being where they are and not knowing what they need to know, so they left. And so that's, that's one of the things we're gonna to try to do. I hope at the end of my term as, as the chair of public education, we can look back and say, the one thing that happened is we improved student, student outcomes for everybody particularly those students who were consistently and ranked at the bottom. Right. So for, um, you know, I know that the pandemic obviously is one of the main issues that you're looking at um, as chair of this committee, but also, you know, then the winter storm hit. <laughs> I right. think, you know, that, that was unexpected. Right. And now we've got multiple mm -hmm. crises going on. Right. Exactly. And I've heard stories of school facilities that were flooded um, of families who still don't have access to potable water. How is your committee going to be addressing the after effects of the storm for public education? Well, the first thing that, that we've got to do is figure out how to create safe schools, uh, safe in the sense that, that, that children ought to, be, ought to be in school. That's the first thing, children ought to be there. Um, and what does that mean? Does that mean we get all the teachers, for example, Vaccinated. Well, I think so. I think the science says that if we do that, then we 
we have less of an opportunity to have a problem. So you think, sorry, you think that they should be prioritized earlier than they are for vaccinations? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I don't, I, I think they're, they're part of the first responders that I think of the way I think of teachers. Um, but, 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 you know, the, the thing is that a lot of times um, children who we now, who were coming to school before, have somehow or another dropped off the map. We have children that districts can't find. They can't locate them. And particularly in the lower grades, we have kids that just off the map, they don't come to school. Well, I think part of the problem is the parents are home. They don't have jobs. They, their, their careers have kind of been affected by this pandemic, which causes them to be at home. And, and some of them are actually working from home. Well, then they decide that, well, I'll keep little Johnny at home. But we've got to convince them and let them understand, have them understand that part of going to school is part of that process of learning. Um, and we've got to do everything we can to make sure that we improve that learning. Now, I know a lot of people are running around and um, trying to advance uh, virtual learning um, in light of this crisis, but I think uh, that's probably got to play a part, but I think we ought to step back and take the 5,000 foot look at how we deliver education services and what we're going to do in the future. It may not look anything like what we did in the past because what we did is we simply built on the little red schoolhouse concept and said, okay, we've, we've built these buildings and so now we've got to have kids in them and so now we're going to have to do uh, what we can to protect that. That, not, that may not be the way we need to deliver education services to children. For example, I've said that, that while many kids don't have access to a computer or don't have access to the Internet, they all have TVs. And, and what would cause us to be able to put or deliver educational services on the television? Where sometimes, you know, these kids are more in tune to that than they are in sitting up in a classroom, but you might be able to reach them and particularly some kids far better and have a greater opportunity to deal with them to make sure they're getting it by choosing another way of, of delivering the same education services. So you think in-person education though is, is the way that schools should be trying to deliver education? Yeah, during, you know. the pandemic. Yeah, because, you know, as, as I got older uh, and this perhaps affects uh, not only younger kids, but the older kids too. I learned a whole lot just going to school uh, and being at school um, and not necessarily in the classroom, but you learn a lot of things about socialization and, and dealing with other people and things that you're just not going to have the benefit of if you're staying at home, locked in a closet, trying to learn. You may learn your ABCs, but what good does it do you if you don't know how that relates to the person next door? Uh, kind of thing. And, and so I think we've got to do a whole lot better at that. Yeah. As you can imagine, a lot of the questions that uh, we've gotten about this event has been related to the STAR uh, exam. And uh, the Texas Education Commissioner told my boss, Evan Smith, <laughs> recently that parents who um, have kids who are learning remotely and don't want those kids to take the STAR can just keep them home. I've also heard from a lot of parents who are already planning to do that, um, who really don't want to send their kids in for the purpose of the STAR. Um, and we know that kids are dealing with challenges in their home lives and, and haven't really been able to focus on school. So how useful do you think that those results are going to be with the, with the STAR moving forward this spring? Well, I don't, I, you know, I question uh, what the star, particularly in light of the situations we find ourselves in today, what is it really measuring? Is it measuring their, their student achievement? Is it measuring their emotional behavior? Uh, is it measuring how they have re been able to respond to this pandemic? Um, is it measuring uh, how well they've been at home? I, I think, first of all, I think we need to back away and maybe take a a better look at testing um, in and of itself. Um, because I, my personal view is that I think testing 
ought to tell you where kids are uh, so that you can form uh, a better uh, track for them on how to get them to where you want them to be. Um, and what that means a lot of time is you may be doing diagnostic testing um, more than you are testing to find out whether the kid pass or fail. I, I just, I, I don't think we need to do that necessarily, particularly in terms of where we are today, um, because clearly kids' education has been affected. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I think that what's happened uh, in almost every household is that children have had a downturn in how they have been able to achieve educationally. Um, and having said that, when you take a test, what's the test going to measure? Is it going to measure um, all of these things that have now affected you? Is it measuring them? Or really is it telling you about their education? I, I'm, you know, I'm just convinced that we, we need to take a look at the testing overall. And certainly in light of now, the, the situation now, uh, we need to back off from it. Mm. Yeah, earlier this week, so I, I know there, there have been a, there's been a lot of clamoring for Texas to not offer the star this year to, to ask for a waiver. The Biden administration recently said that states actually do have to test students and they're not giving out waivers for standardized testing, but they did give some flexibility to states, including giving the tests remotely, uh, moving them to the summer or fall or shortening the tests. Um, is Texas considering any of these options and, and do you think they should? Well, I, we obviously, in terms of the feds, we have to, uh, we have to listen to them uh, because a lot of the money um, that we get in education comes is federal monies. And so we're kind of tied to them because we get the money. Uh, I think we ought to listen to them, but I think more than especially, we ought to have input into them in terms of what policies they're making so that we're just not um, sort of the, the, the tail that's getting caught um, at the end because we have to, we have to follow their guidelines. I think we ought to make sure that we have input into what they're making decisions on because it's simply, you know, to say we're going to test them. Well, okay, but what are we going to do that for? Why are we testing them? Is there a reason that we need to test? Uh, and what do we discern from the testing? Um, do we say that, well, kids are one level, one grade level, two grade levels, three grade levels behind, or, or what does that mean? What does that mean if the score is whatever it is on the STAR exam for a child? Um, does that say anything more about the child or does it say more about us? Uh, and so I, I just think that um, I've tried to get an input into some of the things that feds are doing now, because I think that's sometimes they, they're not um, close enough to the problem to understand the magnitude of the problem and the, and the magnitude of some of the things they're suggesting as the way to solve the problem. Right. But for this, I mean, for this iteration, it seems like they've made their decision, at least on, in terms of the waivers. I'm curious if you think that moving, uh, moving the STAR administration to the fall would help in terms of, you know, students and, or teachers being more prepared, um, or if that, you know, that just isn't well, yeah, it be an option. Well, it, I mean, obviously it does. It takes a little bit of the pressure off, uh, but I still say, what does it measure? Um, I mean, you know, uh, to say something is, uh, for example, just to use generally, if I said something is eight feet long, well, what does that mean? What is it that I'm measuring? Uh, what am I measuring? If I'm measuring uh, a banana, then that's, that's pretty bad. But if I'm measuring an automobile, I didn't really get it right. And so my, uh, the point I'm making is this, is that testing ought to have an identified way of measuring something that we want measured. And if the feds don't understand that, um, that we're testing just for testing sake, that doesn't make any sense at all to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then do you, I mean, 
what does that mean for Texas? Are you telling well, people to not administer the star <laughs> this year? Well, I'm saying, well, if, if we administer it, uh, I'm not saying we should or shouldn't. I'm saying that if we do measure it, um, I'm not, I mean, if we do take it, I'm not sure what the results mean. Do they mean something? What do they mean? I don't, I just don't get it. I don't understand sure. how uh, Texas could be there, be doing it. I don't understand how any state would actually be in a situation now to test students to see how well they're doing. I, you know, um, I think the, the deficit in learning mm. is going to manifest itself. I don't care how much you try to s ignore it. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, we need to do better at delivering the education to students so that, so that we can make sure that they're learning what we want them to learn. Um, so I, I just think that there needs to be more conversation about this because not just about the STAR test now, Mm -hmm. But perhaps there ought to be questions about testing, period. Sure. Uh, because that's something we need to take a better look at. Yeah. So with uh, the time we have left, I want to talk to you about money. Uh, so this year, uh, the state has said that they're not sure whether they're going to fund school districts um, for the decline in enrollment and attendance that they've seen because of the pandemic. So the the quote unquote hold harmless that uh, yeah. I'm sure you've been, right. you've been hearing a lot about. Already, yes. yes. I, well, let me say this too. I, you know, we are gonna do a hold harmless. Now, the, the magnitude of the hold harmless, we're still debating. Uh, we're still trying to figure out because uh, the devil is always in the details. Um, but I think we've got to incentivize school districts to go out and find these kids uh, on the one hand. And so, Somehow or another in the whole harmless, to the extent that we can cause that to happen, I think we need to take a look at it. So districts will be encouraged, uh, even with the whole harmless, to go out and find these kids and get them back in to their system. Uh, but, so, but we're still working on that. That's going to happen. So okay. districts can say, hey, thanks, thank God we're going to get this done, mm -hmm. but, but it's something that we're going to do. So what can you say about the specifics of that um, that you haven't already said? So it's going, will it actually cover the full uh, enrollment or attendance declines that districts are seeing? Well, that's something there's, there's, uh, you know, there's people right now on both sides of that particular issue. And, and I think but that at the end of the day, what we'll end up with is something that um, provides an opportunity for districts not to be as, as affected as they might have been otherwise, but it also have a encouragement in it for districts to go out and make sure they make every effort they can to locate and find children. Mm -hmm. Because what we don't want to do is have the whole harmless and, and districts simply do nothing um, and these kids remain out there. Then we're gonna have to have the whole harmless, not just this session, we'll have to have it next session. Mm -hmm. uh, and what will happen then is the deficit in learning will be far greater because the kids still haven't been to school, haven't been to a school. So it's in our own best interest to have the districts go out and find these kids. And to a large extent, we're gonna make sure that we have a bill uh, in the whole harmless provisions that causes them and helps them do that. Okay, is this going to be through uh, the legislature, through the commissioner, where should we expect where should I expect uh, to look for that? I, I think we'll have legislation that will do that. That's, okay. that's ultimately what we're going to do. Okay. So it might actually take a longer time than, you know, being an immediate solution. Yes. It might actually be toward the end of the session. Right. That the districts right. will get that information. That's right. Well, we'll get it done. We're going to get it done, though. Okay. Uh, because I know districts are hurting. Uh, I've heard stories about districts having 50% of their younger kids not even... Uh, just to falling off the radar. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just think that's horrible for us because that doesn't just affect them this year. That affects them throughout the whole education career that they have in public schools um, and ultimately affects all of us. And so we've got to do everything we can 
to make sure these kids get back in school as soon as, as quickly as they can. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure, I mean, for the record, I'm sure a lot of uh, administrators would say and, and teachers would say that they are working on finding their kids. They are sending people out to yes. you know, knock on doors and things like that. Right. They feel well, like they're not doing enough. Well, I, you know, I've looked at the program, for example, Dallas ISD has, uh, and I like it. I, I thought it was a great program. Um, I don't know yet about the success of it, but but I do know uh, the effort seems to be there. And I think more districts ought to adopt that philosophy uh, so that they'll get it done. Uh, I just don't want to sitting back waiting for the kids to come back as if somehow or another that's going to magically happen. Um, because I don't think so. I think what we'll have to do is we'll have to get up out of our seats. Uh, we'll have to knock on doors. We'll have to have everything we can to get them back in school. Because again, having them back in school accomplishes a number of things. There are so many kids who are, you know, they're, they're, the meals, for example, were at school. Um, what they learned um, was just absolutely affected by all this pandemic. And now we've had this, this you know, this crisis um, in electricity, which is going on. I, I just can't, I can't think of enough things that, um, that have affected. I, I told somebody that, that we got we to gotta make it happen. Though. We've got to do everything we can to get these kids educated and no matter what the hurdles are. And yeah. so we're going to be doing that this session. And so uh, I'm looking forward to it. Sure. So uh, Texas has received $5.5 billion in federal stimulus money for schools. There might be another set of money that, that might be even oh, larger in the that's package coming, that's coming yes. right? Um, for this $5.5 billion, what exactly do you think that money should be used for? And then, you know, a question I've gotten a lot is how much of that can go directly to school districts without, you know, strings attached or without, uh, you know, specific uh, things that it has to be used for? Well, think to, this, to, the extent, to the extent that districts have been affected both by the coronavirus pandemic and by um, this electricity outage we've had, the weather problems that we've had, I think we've got to take care of those first. I think we've got to make sure that districts are um, at least as unaffected as we can um, by those things. Um, secondly, I, I realize that we've got to fund the things we did in House Bill 3. We've got to have the funding for those things that have got to come uh, out of this session. Um, and I think, well, I'm convinced that we're going to do it because almost everybody, all the leadership recognizes um, that, that the commitment we made during last session to public education, we have to continue that commitment during this session. And so I think that's going to happen. But in terms of the uh, specifically about the 5.5 billion, we're still looking at, at, at how to get that to districts so that districts that are affected most by that can end up with the, you know, a better share of the money that goes toward fixing all the problems they face. And is that something that should be expected again through the legislative process? Well, I think the, I think the commission can do it. I think the, yeah, I think uh, TEA um, by and large can do that to the extent that it needs uh, legislation. I can tell you we'll be right up front doing that. Uh, and we've been working with um, uh, Commissioner Morath and we'll continue to do that uh, as we go through this. And so I'm looking forward to making sure that um, that money gets spent properly. Sure. We have just a couple minutes left. I wanted to ask, um, you know, for the people watching, what is the uh, the process for participating in the committee going to look like? Are you planning on having, um, you know, meetings in person? Are you planning on having uh, well, witnesses testify uh, remotely? Well, we'll have both. We'll have, hopefully the majority of people will be testifying uh, in person, but we will have some, um, remote virtual testimony uh, that will have to take place. Um, you know, the rules, we had to change the rules to accommodate this because our rules didn't even 
never portended that we would have a problem like this. And so we were not able to have remote um, testimony. But, but now we've changed the rules so that it can be accommodated. Now it's going to be, it may be a little rocky starting out because it's, it's new territory for all of us, but we'll get through it. And, and I hope what it does is it causes the public to be more involved uh, in taking a look at what the Public Education Committee, because I think therein lies uh, for us the greatest benefit that comes out of this whole tra tragedy and crisis uh, with the pandemic uh, is that uh, we can now bring the public closer uh, to us in terms of what we're doing. And that I think helps, helps us get the problems identified and solved without a whole lot of loss between the legislature and the public. With that, we are out of time. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for Representative Dutton for joining us. We got uh, 30 minutes already? We did, yes. I know it flies uh, by. <laughs> uh, for more coverage from the Texas Tribune, visit texastribune.org or sign up to get the latest updates on education with our weekly newsletter at trib.it slash edu. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, too. And let me just say that you can call me and I'll come back anytime. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs>